Well, hello, City First Church. We are so glad that each and every one of you are with us today. I want to take a moment, welcome all of our locations, Cape Coral, City First Anywhere, our favorite. Can we give it up for God Behind Bars? And of course, everybody right here at Spring Creek. We are so glad that each of you are in church today. And it's hard to believe that today is October 31st, the last Sunday in October. You know what that means, that there is only 55 days until Christmas, and tomorrow is the acceptable day to start putting up your Christmas decorations, according to myself. But the summer has already come and gone, and I can't believe it, and part of me still misses the summer, and Adam and I have two boys, Nash and Ryder. Nash is six, Ryder is four, and summer is their very favorite time of the year. And so this summer, our boys begged us to take them camping, okay? Is anybody in here a camper? You enjoy camping. Okay, we are not much of campers, so we were like, well, how about we put a tent up in the backyard? They were like, no, we want to really go camping. So they finally wore us down, and we committed to take these kids camping, and we are preparing for this long rugged weekend. We packed up like our whole house into our car. And then we went to the campground where we rented a small cabin that had air conditioning and a mini fridge. We were like, we're ready to rough it, boys. And so we had a really fun time. We did the whole campfire thing and s'mores. But out of all the things that we brought with us and packed up, if you know my husband, Adam, he is a clean freak. And the thing that we forgot was his toiletry bag. And so he has no soap, no shampoo, but being the professional camper wife that I am, I was like, don't worry, I packed Dawn dish soap. And Adam was like, if it's good enough for the ducks, it's good enough for me. And so he used that the whole weekend. And then the weekend came and went, we are loading everybody up in the car, and the boys are in the back seat, and they're actually being really quiet because they have played so hard. They're like coloring, and Adam and I are talking and kind of recapping our time. And I was like, that was so much fun that we went camping in a cabin, but I'm ready to be home. And Adam was like, you're ready to be home. He's like, I've been showering with Dawn all weekend. And then Nash from the back seat just pops up his little voice and he was like, Daddy, who is Dawn? And we said, no, son, no, son. Dawn is not a who. Dawn is a what? It's Dawn dish soap. But while, yeah, we're like, the kids are going to go to school and tell their teachers. I'm like, those pastor's kids. But anyways, pray for us. But while we were camping... They had all these signs everywhere that there were animals, and the signs would say, do not feed the animals. Do not feed the animals. And we've all seen pictures like this before, right, at zoos or at parks. It's like, do not feed the birds. Do not feed the monkeys. And this is up for a reason more than just people who love to have rules posted everywhere, but because there are only certain things that are good for animals to consume, right? There are only certain things that are good and that animals are able to digest. And do you know that in the same way, we as Christ followers, there are only certain things that are good for us to consume or that we are able to digest. And given that today is October 31st, we know that there's an emphasis on spooky stuff, scary stuff, fear stuff. And I actually can't think of a better day than today for the church of Jesus Christ to gather together, full of faith, lifting up the name of Jesus, right? Because we know he's bigger than any fear, bigger than any worry. And we also know that today is not the only day of the year where there is an emphasis on fear, right? Especially given the last almost two years, there's been so much fear in our culture, in our homes, in our hearts, and in our minds. And just as the animals, their signs say, do not feed the animals because they can only consume so much. Today we're going to title this message, Do Not Feed the Fear. Because there's only so much that we can consume And there's only so much that we as humans can digest when it comes to fear. And the Bible actually talks a lot about fear. And in 2 Timothy, in the New Testament portion of the Bible, there's a verse in chapter 1, verse 7. And it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but of power and love and a sound mind. What a wonderful verse for each and every one of us. And the author of this verse is a guy named Paul, and he's writing to his apprentice, whose name is Timothy. And Paul and Timothy both love Jesus, right? They're both great men of God. And yet, even still, Paul could see that Timothy was timid, and he was feeling afraid. And what that tells us is that if Paul could be afraid, and Timothy could be afraid, these great men that are written about in the Bible— It's that no one is exempt when it comes to the topic of fear. Everybody fears something. We might fear our past. We might fear our future. Maybe there's a fear when it comes to finances. Maybe there's a fear when it comes to failure. Maybe you have a fear about what everyone else thinks about you. Maybe there's a fear that you're going to miss it. Maybe there's a fear of your relational status or lack thereof. Maybe there's a fear of not getting into that college or not succeeding at work. Maybe you're afraid of the coronavirus or of death or fear of being alone or fear of that diagnosis, fear for your children. But when it comes to fear, there's something that's really important that each and every one of us must remember about the verse that we just read, and it's simply this. God has not given us a spirit of fear. See, we can feel afraid, and we will feel afraid, and it comes as a great feeling and emotion. But when we are afraid, we must pause and remember that fear is not from God. Fear is not from God. It sounds simple, but it can be easy to forget this life-changing truth. Fear is not from God. Oftentimes what happens is we feel afraid and we're just busy going through life and we feel this fear and then we just accept it like it is truth. We're afraid and we just receive the fear and then we hang on to the fear and we kind of like settle into the fear. This is just how it is. This is just how I am. We begin to nurture that fear. We begin to believe that fear as truth. We begin to feed the fear. Does anyone else have some friends that are like scared of everything? They're scared to be by themselves. They're scared to go to sleep. They're scared of the night. They're always afraid. And so they'll call you and they'll be like, hey, I'm so afraid of everything. Would you pray for me? And you're like, yeah, I will. Pastor Ryan Leak said I should pray for people. So you pray for them that they wouldn't be afraid. And then a couple days go by and you shoot them a text like, hey, what are you doing tonight? And they're like, oh, man, we're about to stream the scariest creepiest horror movie that ever existed. And you're like, I'm not going to pray for you anymore. Stop watching that stuff. Just stop streaming it. Stop feeding the fear. Stop feeding the fear. And I want to remind us today, instead of receiving fear or instead of feeding fear, we must learn to reject it. We must learn to identify when we feel afraid. Name it, this is fear, it's not from God, and I reject it. It has no place in my home, in my heart, in my mind. This is not from God. Fear is not my friend. And if we know that fear is not from God, then we can identify who does fear come from? The enemy. That's where fear comes from. Listen, as much as we believe there's a very real God, we do believe there's a real enemy. And that enemy would love nothing more than for each and every one of us to live afraid. Because he knows the power in fear, that fear will cripple us. Fear will paralyze us. Fear will cause us to shrink back. We believe in fear and we start to live our lives according to it. But we have to know that fear will not keep you from dying, but it will keep you from fully living. And you are created to live a full and abundant, purpose-filled life. God wants you to live that way. The enemy doesn't. The enemy would want nothing more than a bunch of fearful Christ followers quietly being crippled by fear, placing worry as our master when we are called to shine bright for Jesus during dark times. See, God knew that we would be afraid, and Paul knew that Timothy would be afraid. That's why he not only reminded him fear is not from God, but then he's so good, he lists what is from God. That is a helpful list, right? Fear is not from God, but let me tell you what comes from God. What comes from God is power. 
I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that the power of the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Do you know the Bible says that the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in you? And we forget that. We walk around defeated and timid and afraid, but the power that rose Christ from the dead lives in you. Therefore, not because you're good or you deserve it, but because he's good and he loves us. We can walk around and we can, have fear. we can have power over temptation. We can have power over problems. We can have power over addictions. We can have power over our thought life. We can have power, not because of us, but because of God. He wants you to walk in that power. What else does he give you? Love. How amazing that we each have the ability to be loved and also to love. You know, Jesus is the ultimate expression of love. And when he was on this earth, we saw that he put love into action. He was always serving people, washing the disciples' feet, serving other people, performing miracles, feeding the hungry, helping the needy. He was always loving other people. And when we are busy loving, we don't have time to be paralyzed by fear because we got important things to do. So we want to remember that God gives us love and calls us to be loved. And the last thing on that list is a sound mind. A sound mind. Man, we each and every one of us long for that sound mind. Do you know that the ancient Greek word for sound mind had the idea of a calm, self-controlled mind? What a contrast to the panic and confusion that accompanies fear, right? When we're in a fearful situation, there's panic, there's confusion. But when we are doing what God has called us to do, to have a sound mind. There is a peace and there is a calm. So the question is, how do we move away from living with fear at the center of our lives, right? Because we don't want to live that way. That's not how God wants us to live. There's two things I want you to remember today. Reject and receive. Could you say that out loud? Reject and receive. Okay, so we're going to learn to reject fear. We're going to learn to identify it when we feel it, and then we're going to reject it. We're going to say, this is not from God. This is not what he wants from me. And then we are going to humbly receive God's power, love, and a sound mind. There will be times when I pause throughout the day, and I will just remember, God, I receive (laughs) your power, your love, and a sound mind in this situation. We can receive that humbly because of God. I love what the same verse says, but in the Amplified Version, 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. Now, some of you, you're like, okay, I've been with you, Lisa. Your camping story was funny, and I don't want to be fearful. But when it comes to personal discipline, you're like, whoa, I wish Pastor Jeremy was speaking today because I don't want to do any of that personal discipline stuff. But here's the deal. If we want the results, the calm, well-balanced mind, and self-control, we have to put in some work. We're going to have to do our part. See, God will do his part, has already done his part, but we have to do our part. So what does using sound judgment and discipline look like? Let's not overcomplicate it. It might mean watching less of the news, turning off some of your news notifications. You cannot consume and digest every bad thing that is happening all around the world every minute of your day. You're not built to do that. Okay, it might mean not watching scary movies so that you can have a good night's sleep and you're not full of fear. It might mean feeding the fear a lot less and being mindful of what you focus on. It might mean that you start to actually think about what you are thinking about. And then you use that sound judgment. Is what I'm thinking about fear-based, faith-based? Okay, fear is not from God. See, I'm not normally a fearful person, Uh, My husband, Adam, calls me like an eternal optimist. Like I'm always like half glass full, normally positive person. But the time where I experience fear is when I lay my head down on the pillow at night 
I, I start to think about everything that went wrong that day, everything that could have gone wrong that day. I think about everything that could go wrong the next day. I think about all the evil in this world and how I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and I start to think about what their future will be. I think about those who are hurting and broken all across the world in my own insufficiency, and I start to feel overwhelmed. But for me, when I start to feel that fear, I have learned this truism that never seems to fail me, and it's very simple, okay? And it's just this. You cannot think about two things at the same time. You can't think about two things at once. So when my mind is going down the fear path, which is unproductive and not from God, I pause and I think about what I'm thinking about, and then I switch my focus from thinking about my own words and my own fear, and I start to think on God's word, the Bible, and the reason that I like to call it God's word is because not only is it the inspired word of God penned through man, but because words from the right person at the right time, woo, they bring me assurance. Have you ever been going through it? You're in a crazy situation. You're facing a big problem. You're facing a deadline. And you're like, I don't know how this is going to work out. It's not going to work out. This is not going to end well for me or for them. And you start to panic. And then you get a notification on your phone if your sound is not turned off. And you get a text message. And it's from somebody that you trust that's proven. And they just say, hey, I want to let you know I already did that. Hey, I want to let you know I got that covered. Hey, I want to let you know I believe in you. Hey, I want to let you know I prayed for you. Hey, I want to let you know it's going to be okay. And all of a sudden you feel that peace wash over you in that moment. How much more powerful is God's word for each and every one of our lives? God's words bring us, insur bring us assurance and we can trust in him. And so we have to learn to lean on and trust God at his word. Because if we really think about fear, fear is really a misplace of trust anyways. When we fear, we're trusting some make-believe outcome. When we fear, we're trusting what could go wrong. And so when we fear, we're putting our trust in what could go wrong instead of putting our trust in Jesus. And we want to trust him because he's proven and true. I love this quote from Billy Graham, who was an amazing evangelist, the best of our time. And it says this, anxiety is the natural result when our hopes are centered in anything short of God and his will for us. Fear and anxiety are the natural result when our hopes, our thoughts are centered in anything but God. And so we want to learn to uproot fear from the center and to put Jesus at the center. And so at night, when fear starts brewing, I find myself trying to center my thoughts on God. And the best way I know how to do that is by reading scripture. And so I'll lay in bed and I have my Bible app. And often I find myself reading Psalm 23. And I've read this psalm so many times. I basically have it memorized because I don't want to trust my own words. I want to trust God's word. And if you don't have a favorite psalm or passage, I encourage you to borrow my favorite, Psalm 23. And I want to share it with you today. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a beautiful passage that resonates with our souls. We're like, yes, I love this. The Lord is my shepherd, and because he leads me and guides me, I don't have to want. He's got me covered. And then about a month ago, as I'm reciting this in my mind, I thought, there's probably a lot I don't know about this passage. And so I started researching Psalm 23 over the past few weeks and months. And I have learned so much 
And I want to share a little bit of it with you today because it's been so powerful in my own life. See, the author of Psalm 23 is David, and in the time that he penned this, he was King David, but he grew up as a shepherd boy. And so he was very familiar with the role of a sheep and the role of a shepherd. And do you know that all throughout the Bible, Christ followers are likened to sheep? Some of you are like, I wish we were like tigers or lions or something powerful, but we're likened to sheep. And so David makes some profound parallels as the Lord as our shepherd and we as his sheep. He says that he leads us to lie down in green pastures. Another phrasing for that word would be that he settles us down in green pastures. Woo! Some of you are like, that is for me today. I just need to be settled in God today. And when I thought about that, I was like, yeah, settled in green pastures. That actually sounds really nice, right? I'm like, this is what I picture when I see, when I think of a green pasture. That's so peaceful and beautiful. And then I think, and I'm like a sheep lying down, settled in green pastures. Got a photo, right? We're like, it's so nice. I love being that cozy, happy sheep, all comfy in that green pasture. I'm so glad I came to church today. But then I was laying there thinking about green pastures. I thought, wait a second. The Bible was not written in America. What do the green pastures look like in the context of what King David was writing? Because David was writing this in the Middle East. So we started looking up green pastures in the Middle East, and I learned a couple things about it. In the Middle East... It's very dry. They have a rainy season for just a couple months out of the year, and even their rainy season produces just a meager couple of inches of rain. So this is what a green pasture looks like in the Middle East during the rainy season. So then I thought, well, what does it look like the other nine months out of the year? And this is what the green pasture looks like the other nine months out of the year. Right? We want to go back to that sheep. And the green pasture was so cozy. This doesn't look as cozy. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking, well, what in the world do the sheep eat in this pasture? Because it doesn't look like there's a lot of green for them. And it reminded me of the verse that's quoted in the New Testament where Paul is saying, I've learned to be content with a lot in the rainy season, and I've learned to be content with just a little bit in the non-rainy season. And what I learned is what the sheep eat in these green pastures is that every night there's a little bit of precipitation, just a little bit, and it goes and it lands by the rocks. And when the wind comes in, it produces just enough condensation along the rocks where little tufts of green grass are grown. We have a photo of this too, just little tufts of green grass all along the desert hidden in the hillside and by rocks. And without a shepherd, the sheep could never lead themselves to find this food. They would just be wandering in the desert. So while we're likened to sheep, we have terrible sense of direction by ourselves. But when we are following a shepherd, he will lead us where we need to go, when we need to go there. We don't have to worry about tomorrow or the next day or 10 years from now. All we have to be concerned about is following Jesus. We have this mission statement around here. We exist to introduce everyone to Jesus and teach them to follow him. Why? We don't need to fear when we are following Jesus. We don't know where the next day's provision is going to come from. We don't know where that healing is going to come. We don't know, but Jesus knows. And our job is to simply follow him. Follow Jesus. Trust in him. Don't trust in fear. Trust in Jesus. He will lead you where you need to go. It goes on to say in Psalm 23, 4. I could spend all day just in Psalm 23, but I won't. Okay, I'm going to share with you one more verse. We already read it. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Okay, now no words are ever wasted in the Bible. Every word matters. Every word is there on purpose. 
So I want you to notice that it says, though I walk through the valley. They're not running through the valley afraid. They're not sitting in the valley, setting up camp there. They're walking confidently through the valley. And as long as they keep walking one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, following the shepherd, they will end up on the other side. They will make it through the valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Can we pause on that word shadow? I want you to think about it. The shadow of the valley of death. When Nash was little, about two years old, I remember I had tucked him in, said prayers, done the song. I went downstairs and he starts crying. And I run upstairs and he's pointing to the wall. He's going, it's scary, mommy. And I look at it and I just said, baby, it's only a shadow. There's something in front of your nightlight that's taking a small image and making it look bigger than what it is scarier than what it is. And fear does the same thing in our lives. It takes something and makes it all consuming, tries to get in the center of our thoughts and our lives. But it's just a shadow. So David writes this and he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How do you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not be afraid? Because of the good shepherd. Remember, the shepherd that we're talking about is describing the role of our Lord and of our Savior. And I want you to catch this, that in every other description in this psalm, the shepherd is placed in the position of guiding and in a position of leadership. He leads us to green pastures. He leads us to still waters. He leads us down paths of righteousness. But the shepherd knows that sheep are afraid of the dark. They're afraid to be in that valley by themselves. And so only in Psalm 23, 4, do we see that the shepherd switches his position. He moves from leading out in front to being with the sheep. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You are with me. Maybe you feel like you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. In your marriage, with a diagnosis, something going on with your kids, your work situation, it's complicated. You feel alone, you feel unseen, you feel abandoned. You feel like you're walking, barely walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to remember that our God is with you. If you study modern day shepherding, which still exists all around the world, but in the Middle East specifically is where I've been looking, it shows that even today, when the sheep are walking through darkness, the shepherd will move back and all the sheep like, huddle around the shepherd. So the shepherd is literally in the middle of the flock of sheep and he's walking and the sheep are walking with them. And the sheep are trained to know their shepherd's voice. They can distinguish their shepherd's voice from any other shepherd's voice. They know their shepherd's voice. And do you know that sheep, which we are likened to, have terrible eyesight? They feel it's dark, they can't see where they're going, but they have impeccable hearing. And so the shepherd gets real close to the sheep there, he's with them and he speaks to the sheep and he sings songs over the sheep. And as long as the sheep can hear the voice of their shepherd, they can keep going. And not only do they just keep going, and not only is the shepherd with them, what does it say? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. So if you are walking through something difficult today, I want to remind you that the shepherd walks with you. And he will provide comfort for you. And he will protect you. And he will be with you. All you have to do is reject the fear, stop trying to do it on your own, and instead invite 
Jesus into the center of your thoughts, the center of your life, the center of your schedule, the center of your conversation, and allow him to lead you and guide you and allow him to be with you. And if you're like, man, I want to hear the voice of my shepherd so clearly like the sheep do, I want to encourage you to come back next weekend. We're launching a brand new sermon uh, series called Do Not Disturb. We're going to learn how to turn off the right, the wrong voices and tune in the right one. But we're going to end a little bit differently today. And the team has prepared a song that they want to sing over you. And my prayer is that during this song, you would pause and you would say, here's the fear that I've been buying into, that I have to do this by myself, that it's always going to be this way, that there's never any hope, that my marriage is always going to struggle, that I'm never going to, what's the fear you've been buying into? Would you reject it? And would even now in this moment, would you receive God's love? Would you receive God's power? Would you receive the sound mind that he is longing for you to live with? Let's go ahead and we're going to sing this song now. Oh, yeah. 
situation is maybe trying to brew fear in our lives, we pause and we reject it, God, and we say it's not from you, and instead we receive your power, your love, and a sound mind. God, I pray that we would go forth from here today in boldness, that we would be encouraged. God, that our minds would be centered on your word and on your truth, and that you would be what's leading us. God, we don't want to follow fear. We want to follow you and everything that you have for our lives. And if you're in this room today, maybe you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, to make him the leader and forgiver of your lives. We want to pause and we want to give you an opportunity to do that. What that means is you believe that Jesus is who God says he is, the son of God, came to this earth, died on a cross for our sins, rose again, giving each and every one of us a fresh start. And so many of us in this room have already made that decision or online, but if you've never done that, we wanna give you an opportunity to do that today. So if everyone wants to go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes, let's let this be a personal decision. You're not joining a church, but you're saying, I wanna follow Jesus. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, today I'm deciding to follow Jesus. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see a couple hands over here. Thank you. You can go ahead and put your hands down. I see more in the back. I know there's hands going up online as well. But so that nobody feels alone, let's go ahead and all repeat this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus, that he died for me, forgives my sins, gives me a brand new start. Today I choose to follow him. And in your name, Amen. Can we give everyone who made that decision today a huge round of applause?